Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. How's everybody doing? All right. Horrible? It's What's great. so horrible? Confused by ATPs? <laughs> by the relationship between blood oxygen levels and uh, yeah. the oxygen and the pH. Yeah. Okay, okay. So um, I usually give a review session uh, before an exam, and I haven't even talked about it. Um, my schedule is a little wacko, um, but I'm willing to try to do something. Um, I'm thinking tomorrow evening sometime might work. Unfortunately, my wife's going to kill me for this. I have a dinner engagement with some friends tomorrow night, so that means we'd have to do it early if we're going to do it. Um, how many would, would like a review session? Uh, <laughs> 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 Two hands. Okay. All right. So it's going to be kind of last minute. Let me tell you what I'm going to plan to do. I'm going to try to get something set up for 5 o'clock tomorrow night. Um, and I won't have a room until sometime tomorrow. So I'll send an email out sometime during the day uh, about where I can get a room to do this, okay? Because I have to schedule rooms. Yes? I will record it, but it also takes a while to get that posted. So I, I will do the best I can to get it posted, but yes, I do record this, okay? So let's shoot for that for tomorrow evening. Keep hanging by your email, I will try to get that set up first thing in the morning so I can figure out where it's going to be. It will be at 5 o'clock, and I will have to be done by a little bit after 6, but most review sessions I do, they end up being done in about an hour anyway, so I don't think that'll be a problem. Then my wife can kill me, and you guys will get the review session, and everybody will be happy, okay? Okay. All right. So um, today I want to um, try to finish up to talking about control of enzymes, okay? So control of enzymes is, um, I think you're hopefully getting to see, important and interesting. So we saw allosterism. We saw how covalent modification occurs. All right? I'm going to show, say some more about covalent modification today. But somebody asked me after class yesterday, is phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, are they both covalent modifications? The answer is absolutely yes, because they both involve uh, a change of a chemical bond in a protein. Okay, either the addition of or the removal of a bond in a protein. All right, I want to show you uh, two other examples of phosphorylation, not to snow you, but just to show you different things that cells do with some of these modifications. The first of these is a pump that we will talk about probably next week. Um, and this pump is a really interesting one. It's called the sodium potassium ATPase. This pump allows you to keep your cells from bursting, okay? Your cells, based on the things that they have in them, have a, uh, if they didn't have this pump, would have a tremendous amount of osmotic pressure on them, and they would burst, okay? But what this pump does is it uses covalent modification as a way of moving ions across a membrane. It uses covalent modification as a means of moving ions across a membrane. I'll tell you what this pump does first, and then I'll tell you how it does it next, okay? So what this pump does is it messes with the osmotic balance of cells. It has to because cells, as I said, are under osmotic pressure. How does it mess with osmotic balance? Well, it preferentially transports sodium ions out of the cell. It preferentially transports sodium ions out of the cell and on the return trip, it preferentially brings potassium ions into the cell. So it creates an artificial gradient of sodium and potassium across a cell membrane. This, tur this turns out to be critical to keep other things from coming across the membrane and literally bursting cells. Okay? So this is a very, very important protein in the membrane of every one of your cells. Very, very important membrane. Yes? It, okay, so her question is, is this something that's moving an ion against its concentration gradient? I think that's your question, right? Yes. And the answer is yes. Okay, we'll talk later about mechanisms of moving ions, but this is exactly what, what um, uh, she just asked me. That is, 
it moves ions against a concentration gradient, meaning it's, it's taking sodium from a low concentration here and moving it out here where the concentration is even higher. It's pushing it in a direction it doesn't want to go. The same thing is true of potassium. It's pushing potassium in when potassium really doesn't want to go in. And this is the reason that ATP is involved. ATP provides the energy to pump that. We call it a pump. And the analogy to a pump is a very valid one because pumps move water or some liquid in a direction they don't want to go. A pump pulls water out of the ground so that you can drink it or use it, moving it against gravity, as it were. These guys are moving ions against concentration gradients. So energy is needed for a pump. And this, in this particular pump, ATP energy is needed. Well, how does it work? All right, I'm going to keep this in very simple terms. Okay. Very, very simple terms. It's only in the simplest terms that we really need to know it anyway. All right? ATP, in the, what it does in this process is ATP donates a phosphate to the pump. This protein is a pump. Okay? It donates it to it, and that phosphate becomes physically attached to the pump during the pumping process. It physically becomes attached to the pump. That's what you see happening right here. Okay, So here's what's happening. Sodium loads up. All right. The ATP donates a phosphate. And the donation of a phosphate causes the pump to change. That phosphate is negatively charged. The phosphate causes the pump to, uh, to change its shape. And it changes its shape so that where there was no opening before, there becomes an opening. And this expels the sodium in the process. So this change of shape provides an opening and it kicks sodium out of the pump. Then that leaves an open end for potassium to come in. Potassium comes in. The phosphate falls off, as you can see here. And when it falls off, it goes back to the original state and potassium gets kicked in. So this covalent modification of the pump, which is the putting on of the phosphate, and the taking off of the phosphate causes the pump to move sodium out and then to move potassium in. And it happens because the change in charge and change in shape of the protein changes with each time, either the addition of the phosphate or the removal of the phosphate. Does that make sense? Yes? Very good question. Do sodium and potassium enter the pump simply by diffusion? The answer is yes, they do. They enter the pump simply by the process of diffusion. Now, it turns out there's some really cool mechanisms that allows the pump to select only one. We won't go into those here, all right? But there's some really interesting um, uh, features that allow the pump to be so specific that it only takes sodium or it only takes potassium. Really interesting uh, stuff. There's Nobel Prizes have been won. Um, on the basis of that selection of those two different ions. Okay, that's really annoying, you know? Okay, so maybe if you put it away, turn it off. I'm sorry? Okay, okay. Well, that's okay, but talking is not. All right. Okay. So, uh, one of the modifications I want to talk about is um, an enzyme. So we can actually see up close and personal how an enzyme is controlled. And this looks a lot more complicated than we're going to treat it here. Okay? We'll talk about this enzyme later in the term, and we'll talk about it in some more detail. Okay? So what I'm going to just want to show you here is this is an enzyme that is important for breaking down glycogen. Okay? Important for gl breaking down glycogen. This enzyme is controlled, okay? and it's controlled by having a phosphate put onto it. Actually, two phosphates put onto it, as you can see here. Okay? This enzyme is called glycogen phosphorylase. Now, glycogen is a polymer that's in our cells. In animals, glycogen is the primary way in which we store glucose. The primary way in which we store glucose. OK? Glucose is, I'm sorry, glycogen is loaded with glucose. All right? But in order for us to use that glucose, we've got to break down glycogen to get it. Well, glucose, glucose is something that our body uses for immediate energy. If you're sprinting, 
if you are trying to escape something, if you are exercising heavily, your body is needing and using glucose, sometimes in very large quantities. Okay? When we have adrenaline, adrenaline, what it's causing is it's causing this enzyme to become active and break down glycogen so we have a lot of glucose. That glucose now allows our muscles to go bowing and we can be a lot stronger than we otherwise could be if the adrenaline weren't flowing. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is that this enzyme, which is controlled ultimately by adrenaline, this enzyme is controlled by phosphorylation. Adrenaline determines whether or not this enzyme gets a phosphate put onto it. Phosphate addition to this enzyme turns out to be a very powerful way of controlling the enzyme. In this enzyme, when we put phosphates onto it, we, can, we put it into a much more active state. A much more active state. Now, there's actually four different states here. I'll focus on this one right down here. Okay? This guy right down here is the most active state of this enzyme. We're not going to worry about the other three for right now. Okay? This enzyme gets converted from an inactive state, okay, or a, a, an active state to a much more active state by phosphorylation. Phosphorylation makes this thing go to town. Okay? The beauty of phosphorylation is the dramatic effect that it has on the enzyme. This enzyme, when it's active, can break down glycogen very rapidly. It's one of these very rapidly working enzymes. And when I gave you the example of the Maserati driving to Fred Meyer and says, we've got to be careful, we don't want to go too fast because we're going to cause problems, this is an enzyme we worry about. Because if we leave this enzyme going for too long, we're going to break all of our glycogen down. We're not going to have any glycogen left for our cells to use. Moreover, as I will tell you later in the term, making too much glucose at a time is deadly for cells because, and this is going to surprise you, glucose is a poison. Glucose is a poison for cells. A little bit, cells need. Too much, then a little bit, cells are dead. All right, so we've got to be careful controlling this enzyme. The bottom line I want you to take away from this thing is that as we move to the right, we're putting phosphates on, we're making something more active. As we move to the left, we're taking phosphates off, we're making it less active. Moving to the right, you notice there's a kinase. And I told you yesterday that kinase puts phosphates onto things. Taking the phosphate off is what a phosphatase does, and that's what you can see in both of these cases here. Phosphatase is taken off, kinase puts it on. Adrenaline causes the kinase to be active. We'll see how and why later, but adrenaline causes the kinase to be active, meaning phosphates get put on. You might say, well, what makes the phosphatase be active? Well, let's think about this. I told you glucose is a poison. How many of you have ever heard that before? A few. Okay. You're going to hear it a lot this term. Glucose is a poison. Okay. Your body treats glucose like it's a poison, but you, didn't, you never thought about it that way before. Okay. You never thought about your body treating glucose like a poison, but in fact, it does. Your body makes a hormone called insulin. What does insulin do in your body? It helps you to take up glucose. Why does it help you take up glucose? Well, when your bloodstream is too full of glucose, it acts like a poison. So your body secretes insulin and tells the cells, take up this glucose to lower the blood glucose concentration because if you don't, you're going to kill me. That's why your body's making insulin. Because glucose is really nasty for you. Well, you say, but if it's nasty for you, why is it taking it up inside of your cells? It's taking it up inside of your cells to reduce the blood glucose. And the cells, the cells can break it down. Cells can use it. Cells can make glycogen out of it. Okay. Now, the reason I tell you that is to tell you that insulin is what actually causes the phosphatase to be active. Insulin is there saying, hey, stupid, quit breaking down the glycogen. I've already got plenty of glucose. You put any more out, you're going to kill me, man. Insulin 
in addition to stimulating the uptake of glucose, is stimulating this phosphatase to turn off glycogen phosphorylase. Pretty cool. We'll see the complexity of this later. That's why this looks like a very complicated diagram. And we'll talk about more about this later. But bottom line, phosphorylation is activating the enzyme. Dephosphorylation is inactivating the enzyme. A lot of other things there we'll talk about later. OK. Um, now, so we talked about phosphorylation, dephosphorylation. There's another um, important level of covalent modification that happens to proteins that I want to talk about. All right? And these are zymogens. Okay? What does that mean? Well, another kind of covalent modification that can occur to, to proteins is we can break peptide bonds inside of proteins. And when we do that, we can either cause them to be active or inactive. Usually, excuse me, usually we are activating them, but not always. Now, let's think about this example you see on the screen. There's an enzyme up there called, and this is, this is something called a zymogen. I'll explain that in a second. Chymotrypsinogen, which sounds an awful lot like chymotrypsin that we've been talking about. But chymotrypsinogen is an inactive form of chymotrypsin. It's inactive. It's made in an inactive form. An inactive form of an enzyme is called a zymogen. That's where that term zymogen comes from. Whenever you see O-G-E-N on the end, it means it's a zymogen. It means it's an inactive form of an enzyme. Now you're sitting here thinking, well, why does the cell bother to go to all the trouble of making an enzyme and making it inactive? And the answer is because proteases do some pretty nasty things. Proteases break down proteins. And proteins are the workhorses of cells. So if we have proteases just floating around in our cells and they're active, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to kill the cell. That's what's going to happen. Digestive enzymes like chymotrypsin are not floating around inside of cells. They are excreted by your pancreas. Excreted by your pancreas. So they're outside of cells. They go into your digestive system and they start to break down proteins, right? Well, even there, why do we want to make it in an inactive form? We're excreting it outside the cell. Well, part of the answer is that we have proteins in our cell membranes. Our pancreas has plenty of proteins in its membrane. And if chymotrypsin were active at the place where it was being made, before it got away, it would start attacking the pancreas. Okay? So the cell makes it in an inactive form, and it gets activated after it leaves the pancreas. What you see on the screen is how it gets activated. This enters the digestive system where there's already active forms of enzymes like trypsin and chymotrypsin and so forth that break specific peptide bonds. No, you don't need to memorize those numbers. Okay? That doesn't matter. What matters is what's happening here. Here's the intact chymotrypsinogen. We see one bond broken right here. That creates something called pi chymotrypsin, which is partly active. And then pi chymotrypsin actually cuts itself to chop out these two little green pieces. And then we have the final active chymotrypsin down here. Notice it's in, four in three pieces. How does it stay together? Hydrogen bonds, but there's a much more important bond that's holding it together. What would it be? Disulfide bonds. These guys are disulfide bonds that are holding this guy together. So it doesn't go flying apart. It stays, it stays together. All right? All right. So at this point, we have active chymotrypsin. And chymotrypsin can go and start digesting things, just like trypsin can start digesting things. Most of the proteases that we make are made in an inactive form, but they get to the digestive system and they become activated. If, just one second, if, if they get activated too soon, let's say they start backing up and you start getting more active and more active closer and closer to the pancreas, that does happen and it creates a very painful, sometimes fatal condition called pancreatitis, where the chymotrypsin is being activated in a place where it should not be activated. It's attacking the pancreas. Yeah, you had a question.
OK, so his question is, are all, all, all zymogens activated by removal of pieces? Not necessarily. Okay? You might wonder, well, what's going on here? What's going on in this process? Well, what's actually happening in this process is we are, we are changing. Oh, I don't have the thing here, unfortunately. I have, I have a nice figure. I don't have it on here. We're actually changing access to the active site. Before this, these bonds get cleaved, the active site is blocked. It can't cut anything because nothing can bind to it. But with the cutting of these two bonds, we're actually opening up the act active site so the, the substrates have access to it. It's a very effective means of control. This is an on-off switch. This is on-off. It means that if you don't clear these bonds, this guy isn't going to do anything because nothing can get into the active site. Yes? Are these reversible? No, these are not reversible. Okay. The only thing that's going to stop this enzyme once it gets activated is if it gets digested itself. And can enzymes digest each other? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. OK. All right, so that's what happens. Uh, we have other systems in our, in our body that use zymogens to uh, make things happen. The most important that we'll talk about here um, is, I'm just going to tell you briefly, is blood clotting. Blood clotting is something that uses zymogens. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense. The clot that forms when you cut yourself is actually a protein called fibrin, F-I-B-R-I-N. That fibrin is pretty remarkable. It's a self-assembling polymer. It builds itself into a structure that holds water. And it does it at the site of a wound. And it does it in seconds. Now you think, that's, that's wonderful, that's miraculous, but why doesn't that happen if I don't cut myself? And the answer is because fibrin is floating around in your bloodstream in very high levels in the form of fibrinogen. And it gets activated and starts to form the clot. And it only gets activated at the place where the cut occurs. That's important. We don't want all the fibrin in our bloodstream to start activating because if it did, we're dead. Stroke, heart attack, bang, right there. This is a remarkable process. We don't have time or opportunity to go through it. If you guys would like to see more about that, come see me, and I'll show you some interesting things about how blood clotting actually works. But blood clotting is one of the best examples I can give you um, for using zymogens to um, uh, control something. OK. Well, the last things I want to talk about today, and yes, we're probably going to finish a little bit early today. The last things I want to talk about today are how it is that enzymes uh, do things. Now we're going to actually get down to the, the very atomic level and see what's happening inside of the active site. We're going to see inside of the active site and see what's actually going on there. OK? All right. Now, chymotrypsin I've talked about before. Chymotrypsin is, I said, a serine protease. Today we'll see why it's called a serine protease. Okay. By the way, today I'm going to talk about some mechanisms. We're going to see mechanism of action. And I'll be honest with you, mechanisms are not my favorite topic, but they're interesting. Okay? We need to understand a little bit about how one enzyme works so we can understand how many enzymes work. Okay. Chymotrypsin normally breaks down proteins. It breaks and cuts peptide bonds. Okay? I like to say that biochemists are lazy people. I'm a biochemist. I can say that about my own profession. I can say this about me. We're lazy people. We like to find the easiest way we can study something. Well, one of the things people found in studying chymotrypsin was that if you try to study the breaking of a peptide bond, it's very tedious. It's a lot of work. What they found was they could give chymotrypsin an artificial substrate that looked like a peptide bond, and chymotrypsin would get fooled, and it would cut it. And when it cut it, it produced a yellow color. Very, very useful. Cutting, peptides bond, cutting peptide bonds doesn't normally give a yellow color. But this compound gives a yellow color. So it allowed them to study how chymotrypsin worked very easily without having to spend a lot of time studying each and every peptide bond being broken. 
All they had to do was mix this compound with chymotrypsin and look at the rate of production of yellow color. Biochemists really are lazy, okay? But when they did this, they found something surprising. They found that the reaction that chymotrypsin is catalyzing occurred in two steps. A very fast step followed by a very slow step. Fast step going up here, fast, and then slow going out here. Okay. So what's going on? Why do we see two different steps to the process? Well, that's actually the mechanism I'm going to talk about. All right. Here's the molecule. You don't need to know the molecule. All that really matters is once this molecule has been cut, all right, has been, um, uh, th this thing has been released, this nitrophenolate, this is yellow. When it's in this form over here, it's not yellow. Yellow, not yellow. Okay? Now, let's take a look at what's happening inside of the enzyme. That's not what I want, sorry. Inside of the enzyme. Okay. Now, I'm going to step you through this. I'm going to tell this to you in words. I can tell you I'm not going to ask you to draw this process. But I do think you should be able to tell me what's happening in the mechanism, which is why I'm going to tell it to you in words. Okay? Let's think about this. Chymotrypsin has an active site. The active site is the place where the reaction occurs. The first thing that happens in any enzymatic reaction, including the one of chymotrypsin, is that the proper substrate must bind in the active site. The proper substrate is a polypeptide, and you may recall it cut adjacent to several amino acids. So we have to have the right structure inside the active site. We're looking in the active site right here. The active site has within it three strategically placed amino acid side chains. One of these is serine. Serine has an OH side chain. One of these is histidine. It's right here. The third one isn't shown in this diagram, but it plays a very important role also. It's known as aspartic acid. Okay. Serine, histidine, aspartic acid are what we refer to as the catalytic triad. Catalytic triad. Serine is why we call this guy a serine protease, because there are many serine proteases, and they all use exactly the same mechanism I'm showing you right here. They all use a serine to help catalyze the reaction. How does it work? All right. First step, enzyme binds proper substrate. When the enzyme binds a proper substrate, we know from the induced fit model what? That the enzyme changes shape slightly, right? Everybody remember that? It's the first question on the exam. Well, maybe not, but it's one of the questions on the exam, okay? All right, so the induced fit model tells us that there is actually change in shape of the enzyme. The change in shape of the enzyme very slightly changes the geometry between the aspartic acid, the histidine, and the serine. They're brought closer together. Bringing these guys closer together, I won't take you through all the individual steps, causes histidine to pull a proton off of serine. Serine loses the H of its OH group. It creates what we call an alkoxide ion. Alkoxide ion. Right? This alkoxide ion is shown right here and alkoxide ion is extraordinarily reactive. It is so reactive, it will attack the first thing next to it, and the first thing next to it here is the peptide bond. It attacks the peptide bond. This happens very rapidly. It's the part of the process I told you that occurred in a very rapid fashion. The peptide bond is attacked. The attack of the peptide bond causes the peptide bond to break. That's what we see actually happening right here. The peptide bond has been broken because oxygen has combined with one half of the polypeptide. The other half has been released. 
This guy now goes flying away. This happened, bang, 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 just like that. Very fast. Well, what we have at this point is something we can't get stuck with because at this point we have the enzyme is now covalently bound to half of that polypeptide that we started with. If we didn't get rid of this, we would use the enzyme exactly once and it wouldn't be no good anymore. We've got to release the rest of this polypeptide from our enzyme. That's what's happening down here. These steps that happen in the bottom are what we call the slow phase of the process. The slow phase. Water has to come back in, okay? I'm sorry, it's over here, we start over here. I'm going the wrong way. So one, two, three, and then down here in the lower left is four. Okay, sorry. So here's water coming back in. The same thing happens when water comes in that happened right up here. This histidine takes a proton off of water and makes a reactive OH that now attacks this bond and look, it releases it. Water, the OH of water is attacking this bond between the O and this polypeptide causing it to be released. This process on the bottom takes longer, it's slow. Okay, let's recap what I just told you. Binding of the proper substrate causes the enzyme to change shape. Histidine pulls a proton off of the hydroxide, creating an alkoxide ion. The alkoxide ion attacks the peptide bond, releases half of it, and gets attached to the other half of it. Then water has to come in. That takes a while. Water has to come in. Proton has to get removed. And this polypeptide bond with serine has to get attacked so that it can get broken and get released. That's what's happening during this process. Okay. There's another region in here I want to mention to you briefly. Okay. It's called the S1 pocket. S1 pocket. The S1 pocket is what binds to the amino acid side chain and tells the enzyme if it's bound to the proper substrate or not. Remember I said the proper substrate binds and the enzyme changes shape? It's actually the S1 pocket that makes that determination. The S1 pocket is located right in the same region. The side chain of an appropriate amino acid binds there, and now the enzyme knows it's got the right thing. So the S1 pocket tells the enzyme you have bound the proper substrate. Questions? No, the S1 will only communicate if it's bound the proper thing. Okay. If it binds the wrong thing, then it will not, the enzyme will not do anything. Okay? So for any, S, for any serine protease, they all use exactly this mechanism. And most proteases use a mechanism related to this. Okay? Well, I said we would finish early. I've got a song to finish this off. So let's sing a song, and then we will call it a day. How's that? It's called the New Serine Protease Song. Please join me. Ready? All serine proteases work almost identically using amino acids try as catalytically. First they bind peptide substrates holding on to them so tight changing their structure when they Get them in the S1 site. Then there are electron shifts at the active site. Serine gives up its proton as the reaction goes on. Next, the alkoxide ion, being so electron rich, grabs the peptide's carbonyl group, 
breaks its bond without a hitch. So one piece is bound to it, the other gets set free. Water has to act next to, let the final fragment loose. Then it's back where it started, waiting for a peptide chain that it can bind itself to. Go and start all over again. Okay, check your email tomorrow about the review session. <laughs>